on behalf of Ngai Terua Hiki Hiki Ki Taumutu, we wish you well in the day's uh, discussions, and uh, I'm sure there'll be some fruitful uh, ideas and work that will come from uh, today's event. Nō reira, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, huri nō tēnā tātou katoa. It's lovely to have you back amongst us, uh, Dame Patsy and Sir, Sir David. Um, we spent, almost a year ago, we spent time at the Marae at Taumutu and looking around the lake at uh, sustainable farming. So it's lovely to have you back in the Takiwa. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the day. And uh, unfortunately, we have another engagement uh, at the Marae with Selwyn District Council, which um, Mayor Sam will be waiting for us. So um, to uh, yourselves. Um, enjoy the, the time here in the Takiwa and uh, koutou katoa uh, ngā mahi. Uh, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, huri nō tēnā tātou katoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome everybody and thank you to Tamutu for starting our day and as you heard we have a very special story um, and association which um, we're very proud of in Hupuna Karikari and those wells of knowledge are so important as we look for those transitions pathways. So I'm Tony Laming, um, the Chief Executive of Blink Innovation and an exciting topic for us today, sustainable protein for a healthy people and a healthy planet. Thank you for joining our conversation today and would really um, encourage you as we're going through the morning to hear the different perspectives and think about um, the questions you have and as we go into the panel discussion to engage and participate. So for us at Blink what's really important is that we create an opportunity for people to come together to hear a range of perspectives. And what's important about that is the ability to be able to then start to take action. We also want to make sure there is diversity in that thought and we're thinking about the different parts of that discussion. We know that dissemination, disseminating knowledge and science to people is really important as we need to act on the challenges that we have. So first and foremost, thank you, um, Your Excellencies, um, for being with us today. Um, I know this is a topic that's really dear to you, so um, it's really exciting to have you back in Lincoln or back in the region in Selwyn to share that with us, and thank you for taking the time out. Um, across the audience, we have a lot of dignitaries, and so I'm not going to name you all, but I would like to thank... Um, we have many um, mayors and deputy mayors here from across Canterbury. This is a critical conversation for our region as the largest food basket in New Zealand. And the Canterbury Mayoral Forum has been actively engaged in thinking about what's next and where do we need to take Canterbury as the food basket, both for our people, for our land, and for that huge export of our food that we take to the world. So thank you for taking the time out. We have councillors from ECAN. We have a number of... Um, deputy and vice-chancellors and ex-chancellors of our universities here. So again, it's great to have you with us as part of the conversation. I would also like to thank the children that are here today. So thank you to all the school children that have either been dragged along by their parents because there's no other option or you're here out of your own choice. It's really great to have you. This is something that is so important for our planet and for our future. One of the things for me has been as I've watched and thought about the climate crisis that we are facing 
and, look, and think about where I am in my life and look at my children and my grandchildren and think about where they will be in 2030 and where they will be in 2050 and realise actually it's a world that I'll still be living in as well. So acting now is so important. So great to have you and please feel free to engage in the questions and, um, today because your perspective is very valuable for us as our future leaders. So Blink Innovation, we heard a little bit about who we are um, from Taumutu. We have been set up to really think about what's next for New Zealand. So not what we're doing now, but what's next. We know that food takes time to change and to grow and to innovate, but it's critical to our country. Whether it's feeding our people, whether it's our com the health of our communities and the health of our world and our planet. So our beautiful country that we live in, it's important that we think about that as well. So how we innovate um, to create healthy people alongside nature is our challenge and part of the topic here today. So what does Blink do? We hold events like this so that we can start those new conversations and create a space where people can come together, hear different perspectives, have colliding ideas, and that's where we start to see innovation, where different perspectives have freedom to grow and to be nurtured and to be started. Um, so a core part of what we do. The second thing that we then do is take those conversations with people that are really are passionate about working with us into programs of work. So um, it could be um, how do we think about the problem differently? How do we design it? Who are those people that we need around the table? So we act as a connector and a facilitator to do that. And then we take that into action. So the projects and the programs that we run. So yesterday, as an example, we had a group from a, a across our whole water ecosystem, talking about what do we need to do next for the next 20 years as we think about that precious resource that we have here in Canterbury, um, which today we harvest and, but what does that mean going forward and what do we need to be thinking about as we grow food for the future? Um, very hard to do those conversations on your own and, and design what's next, but when we come together, we have so much more power to act on things. So we're about connecting, we're about collaborating and we're about innovating and it's about getting impact and results that's really important and where we focus. What we then do is bring the science and the knowledge to bear on those conversations so that we're doing what's, what's right for the world. What we know as we look forward is we don't have all the answers. So again, part of today is to start to um, discover what those gaps could be and how might we fill them and how might we bring our expertise to bear on solving those. And if we listen to Greta Thunberg talk, she goes, don't ask us for the answers. We don't know. When we're in a crisis, we don't actually um, know what we necessarily have to do, but we get on and we start to do things and we adjust along the way. So that's what we're about. Um, we're here today because we have five amazing founders who saw this as, an, as important enough to come together. So I'd like to thank Lincoln University, Manaki Fenaware Land Care Research, Ag Research, Plant and Food, and Dairy and Z for being our founding partners in this journey. Um, it's been exciting so far, and we've got a way to go. Apart from this event, we have a whole range of series that we run during the year. Um, you're always welcome at them. That's on our website. Um, feel free to engage. And what you'll see at the moment is a very common theme as we start to break down the challenge for our planet and how we think about that from those big consumer trends that we have where people want tasty, healthy, convenient food, but they want it to be good for the world. How do we do that? How do we manage our water and our resources and our land so that we leave it better tomorrow? They are big, big topics in their own right. So over this year, you'll see us break those down to really help navigate some of those conversations and bring them to life. We have a co-working space, what we know that coming together and the majority of New Zealand are small businesses. And so what's important is we create spaces for those people to connect and work together. So one of the teams we've got today who you'll get to taste their food is um, Brothers Green, who um, won our Food Start com um, competition last year, have launched their hemp oil to the market, and you'll get to taste what one of their next new products are. So they've been working with farmers and growers in the region um, as well as producers to actually formulate foods that are grown on our lands that are good for our lands. So please make sure you introduce yourselves to them and get to try their product. Um, so why the topic today? Um, 
really important topic as we think about both healthy people. So New Zealand's number three on the list for um, obesity. So one in three New Zealanders is obese today. As a country that grows beautiful food and exports 95% of the food to the world, we've got a real challenge with that connection. So what do we need to do to actually have a healthy people? Because an unhealthy um, country is really expensive for governments to fund and draws money and resources away from the positive things we need. So as the agri-food industry, a real challenge for us to think about what is that process, what is that education, how do we think about that? On the other side of it, we've got a planet that is desperately trying to feed a growing population. We're exporters of food, um, our profile on emissions is quite unique. And so the opportunity for us is to think about this beautiful land that we have and the skills that we have and what do we need to be growing and producing what's next. So if we look around the world today, we see things like um, completely plant-based um, burgers. Everybody loves burgers, but they want a choice about what it's made of and really thinking about that innovation. We see blended products that are 50-50 vegetable and, and proteins. What a great way to get vegetables into children when they don't really like them. So these choices. And then on the extreme end, we're seeing the innovation that's coming through in our biotech industry to grow products and make products that mimic meat, but actually haven't been grown on the land. So a huge a range of diversity, opportunity for our farmers, for our food producers, for our scientists, for our country. So what is that challenge we want to take up? I'm going to hand over to Rod Oram, who's going to lead us today. And um, I'd like to thank the rest of our panelists, so Maury and Karen, for being with us to share their perspectives. Susie um, Cameron's unfortunately not able to join us today. Um, she had a family emergency back in the US, but what she has done overnight is um, provided a video for us, so she will be here in spirit, and you'll get to hear from her and her perspective. So enjoy your morning, and please make sure you engage and get involved. Thank you. Um, Atamarie, good morning. Um, it's my great pleasure to be um, facilitator today, um, but I have also uh, the... Um, the privilege of having a little time to do a, a brief presentation. And um, the, um, I want to just uh, thank all our distinguished guests and others for being here um, today, and uh, particularly for um, our young people. And um, I hope that you were all on strike yourselves last Friday, um, and if you got detentions, you were pinged by your school. I hope your parents uh, went and did detention for you, which seems to be um, the right approach. Um, I'm going to be introducing the other panellists, so it falls to me to introduce myself. Um, I'm a business journalist, and so as such, I take a great deal of interest in what's going on in the world to try to work out um, what the threats and the opportunities are for us in New Zealand. Um, so the issues that uh, we're discussing today are right at the heart of that, uh, both globally um, and in terms of um, uh, for New Zealand as well. And um, so I'm just going to um, step um, briefly through a few slides to set the context for our discussion. Um, we think we're a small country, but we actually, thanks to the tectonic plates, carve this great Z across um, the Pacific. Um, and in fact, um, uh, not only uh, do we have the wonderful land resource in New Zealand, but uh, we have the fourth largest exclusive economic zone, the oceanic resource. Um, so um, all up, we're responsible directly for about 1% of the Earth's surface. But of course, our influence spreads right up into the Pacific to our Pacific neighbours, uh, but also down into the Antarctica as well. Um, so we aren't small. Uh, 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 what we do, particularly around uh, being innovative in these issues, um, is fundamentally important. So I'm going to talk very briefly about um, our journey to regenerative agriculture. By that, I mean that uh, farming and food systems that help restore the ecosystem. Uh, rather than just um, continue to extract from the ecosystem. Um, and um, you'll see why that's important in a mo. And um, I always like a, a slightly romantic title as well, so I'm talking here about reinventing paradise. Um, this is uh, the view of us from our nearest neighbour, a lifeless barren rock, uh, the moon. And um, our resource is actually surprisingly limited um, in the world. So that um, little globule on the right-hand side is all the air in the world, uh, which is only about 2,000 kilometers across. It's less than the drive from Cape Reinga uh, down through our two islands. You wouldn't even get to Bluff. 
Um, and on the other side, that's all the water in the world. Now, that includes uh, all the oceans, which are remarkably thin. So it's a droplet about uh, 1,400 kilometers across. You wouldn't even get halfway down the South Island on that journey. Uh, and all the surface fresh water in the world would be a droplet only 62 kilometers across. So this is our biosphere, along with the land, that supports all life on this planet, uh, not just the 7.7 .7, um, billion people. We humans are very active. Uh, we actively manage, often badly, 75% of the Earth's uh, land surface, minus the ice caps. Um, and uh, in fact, we humans, with our activity, move more of the Earth's surface every year than nature does. Here in New Zealand, we wash 200 million tons of topsoil um, off our paddocks and um, uh, 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 hills uh, down through rivers um, and uh, down to our coastal uh, estuaries and um, um, inshore. Um, this is the planetary boundaries of, uh, devised by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And I just want to particularly draw attention to the um, July 18th um, workshop that um, Blink is offering, because Will Steffen, along with Johan Rockström and colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, were the people who devised the planetary boundaries, and Will's still very involved in that work. Um, he's an absolutely extraordinarily important speaker on these issues, and I can't, uh, and terrifically good at it too, I can't recommend enough to you uh, the July 18th uh, event that Blink's holding. So these are the physical, chemical um, boundaries of the planet, and uh, the uh, bigger the um, overshoot, uh, the greater danger we're in. And the biggest overshoot is uh, biogeochemical flows, which is phosphorus and nitrogen. And that's entirely because of the way we grow food globally. Um, with the use of artificial fertilizers and the like. So the, these are not unique New Zealand problems. This is the problem for agriculture and food systems globally. Uh, along with that comes uh, land change, uh, uh, taking, for example, uh, forest into uh, productive farming land. Um, and of course, um, uh, the biggest overshoot is the loss of biodiversity, i.e. species loss. You know, we are in the sixth great extinction, and uh, we humans are the cause of that. Um, so that's, that's what we're working with. Um, this is a little um, video um, from one of my fellow Edmund Hillary fellows, Felix Ferrand de Chen, who does a lot of work with the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, this is um, a 24-hour snapshot of carbon dioxide emissions in the world because they swirl around. The redder they get, the more intensive they are. Um, so this is uh, part of Felix's genius of being able to visualize these very complex um, interactions. Um, that's at uh, one level an astonishingly beautiful little video, uh, but it's obviously um, an astonishingly uh, worrying one as well. So this is the Anthropocene, the geologists tell us. This is the geological epoch in which we humans are the greatest driver of planetary change. Now, we are a natural phenomenon. So in past um, uh, eras, there have been other natural phenomena. But this time, we are the natural phenomenon uh, driving climate change. These are monumental challenges. Um, and we can broadly see the pathways um, to dealing with this in electricity, um, in transport, in industry and buildings, and uh, in agriculture, um, that's um, just beginning to um, emerge. Um, in terms of bringing these together from a food point of view, um, EAT is a Scandinavian NGO very focused on these issues. Lancet is the Distinguished British Medical Journal. And the EAT Lancet Commission reported in January um, uh, how um, we might progress on healthy food, more and better food for people, um, but doing so in a way that's healthy for the planet. So they're saying this is one of the greatest health and environmental challenges of the 21st century. Um, there is still um, dairy and meat um, in the diets that um, uh, Eat Lancet Commission devised. But very interestingly, they devised the diets first, i.e. what's good for people, before they then looked at the environmental impact of that. And in arriving at these more balanced diets, where there is still dairy, where there is still red meat, but as you can see, much less red meat than, um, than um, people in many developed countries, including ours, are eating, um, that's um, how they arrived um, at a, a roadmap for um, healthy people and healthy planet. Um, Various uh, of our major competitors, such as Danone, are very focused on this. 
Um, so in 2007, they spent over 10 billion US dollars to buy um, a White Wave, a US alternative uh, uh, milk company. But very interestingly, Danone was intrigued by uh, that approach to technology. And so they're starting to apply it all the way across Danone now. So they now, in R&D terms, they call it a Danone Wave um, as they get to grips uh, with changing their company quite significantly. Um, other things going on, there will be a lot more contained farming. This is a, a vertical farm in New Jersey uh, with obviously uh, growing completely uh, normal plants, um, but in a completely contained environment. So essentially no environmental impact. And then of course, uh, there's the likes of cellular agriculture, whether it's applied to uh, milk uh, or, or meat. Um, then lastly, there is the question of the damage we're doing. And uh, the very best report on this is Environment uh, 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 Aotearoa 2019 from MFE, which is um, the first, it's the, it's the second synthesis report of our impact um, on our ecosystem, um, but the first which really lays out the issues in a very um, compelling way. So it, start, it looks at how we live and make a living and then looks at the things we value. And this is a, a deeply interwoven uh, rural and urban issue here. Um, there's no, uh, it gets us nowhere to um, try and divide out those two parts of New Zealand. And, and it's climate change itself as the um, uh, uh, fifth theme, um, which uh, exacerbates um, all the rest. Wonderful document. I um, urge you to read it. Um, last uh, in that New Zealand context is the work of the Productivity Commission on the transition to a low emissions economy. And this is a wonderful uh, uh, set of work, wonderful final report last year. But this is the quote in all that work that best encapsulates it. The shift from the old economy to a new low emissions economy will be profound and widespread transforming land use, the energy system, production methods and technology, regulatory frameworks and institutions, and business and political culture. So that's how profound the change is. And I can't emphasize enough um, the importance of that last word about culture, because ultimately um, that's what um, drives us. And we're all in this together. Um, I think there are great um, synergies to be had between what will be going on in rural New Zealand, particularly around food and farming, and what needs to go on in um, urban New Zealand. And we can't rise to these challenges unless we all move. So there's no point in uh, one half of our emissions profile moving and the other half not, because we wouldn't get there. Um, we're all in this together. And um, the work of the Productivity Commission and before it um, for Globe NZ, um, from Vivid Economics, Globe NZ's um, an all-party backbench MPs group. Um, should know, we know broadly what these transitions look like. I spend a lot of time in the primary sector, and my constant message to farmers is that your farm will be more valuable um, as you're on this journey. Um, it'll also become a far more resilient farm, both ecologically and economically, um, because of the progress you make and um, the diversification you would have. And then, of course, in urban New Zealand, um, Auckland, for example, has a greenhouse gas emissions of seven tonnes per person per year. We've set ourselves a goal of three tonnes um, by 2040, but Copenhagen is already at two and is very soon going to be carbon neutral. Um, and the issues behind urban New Zealand, and 87% of us in New Zealand live in towns and cities. We are a more urbanized country than France, Germany, the United States, the UK, and many other countries. We are a very urbanized country. Um, that's um, an example of the urban challenges. One last point. Through all this, although they're global issues, it's really important that we're very true to ourselves. Um, we will learn from overseas, uh, we will innovate here, we will offer things back to the world. Uh, but it's really important that we're true to ourselves. So, one last story. Uh, this is Naituho, Tuhoi's uh, Tokura Fare, the um, red fare um, in Taniatua. Um, it's the first living building in New Zealand. This is a very demanding international standard um, by which buildings have to be self-sufficient for water and energy. Uh, this was the first thing they decided to invest in when they um, achieved their treaty settlement. 
because they knew in building the building, they would be um, building themselves for the 21st century. This was a very collaborative project for everyone in the Iwi. Uh, I uh, spend a little time with Tu Hoi on these issues um, from time to time. Uh, and I, it's, to me, it's a very powerful um, emblem of um, what's at work. So at that point, I, I will stop um, and um, look forward to um, coming back to the discussion in due course after we've had um, our other speakers. And so our next speaker, um, it's my very great pleasure to uh, welcome our Governor General, um, Her Excellency the Right Honourable Dame Patsy Reddy. Um, from a, a childhood growing up in the Waikato, uh, she went on to a distinguished career in law and business. She was, for example, the first female partner at uh, Watts Patterson, now absorbed by uh, Minter Ellison Rudd Watts, um, and then a distinguished business career, particularly at Briley Investments for 11 years, working on uh, major corporate issues such as Air New Zealand, um, Sky City, and many others. Then a very um, active career um, in government uh, with agencies like NZTA and the arts, such as the New Zealand Film Commission. And of course, as a founding trustee for the very important organization, Global Women. And um, amongst her many other activities was um, chief crown negotiator uh, for the settlement for uh, Toronga Moana and Totoko Toro. And of course, governor general since 2016. A very warm welcome, please, for Dame Patsy. Thank you very much indeed. Rauranga tira ma, e kui ma, e koro ma, e fui fui nei. Tene aku mihi mahana kia koto. Kiora tato katoa. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. And Rod, I thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I think it set the scene so superbly. Um, in fact, probably um, I don't need to say much more. It really was there in front of us. Um, but I am, uh, as uh, has been mentioned, uh, very interested in the production of sustainable protein. So I was delighted when I was given the opportunity to come along and speak for a few minutes. Um, like you, I'm keen to hear from our other speakers too. Now, I'm not here, as you will imagine, as an expert on food production. <coughs> I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a food researcher. I'm not a chef or a little amateur, maybe. Um, nor am I a farmer or a scientist. But what I am is a very keen supporter of New Zealand's innovation and entrepreneurship. We have always thought of ourselves as an ingenious nation. And my visits uh, during my time, my, my uh, first uh, two and a half years as Governor General, I visited uh, many startup ventures, factories, farms, all around New Zealand, and have shown me just how much we value entrepreneurship and uh, innovation. Whether it's tinkering in a shed or a top flight scientist at a research institute, there's a lot of time, energy, and brain power invested in innovation. Possibly not quite enough money yet, but we'll get to that. The issue of feeding an increasingly overpopulated and overheated planet, as Rod's uh, slides demonstrated, offers many challenges, but it also off offers, it opens up opportunities for us, for a nation of innovators. Having already forged our early reputation as suppliers of quality food to the world, we do have a lot going for us. We've got that brand value. We're ideally placed to show leadership in the production of sustainable protein and in championing the new forms of protein that are now becoming available. The way we think about food has been changing. In recent e years, I, like many New Zealanders, have become concerned about what we eat, where it comes from, and how it's produced. And uh, Tony mentioned, to begin with, the epidemics of non-infectious diseases, which are exacerbated by obesity and poor dietary habits. They're not just affecting the poor in the Third World War. World, third World, they're affecting New Zealand too. Um, we ob I observe far too many young New Zealanders who are overweight. Now, I know I'm not a perfect role model, but I can attest to the fact that weight control does not get easier with age. 
So it's really sad that you see young people suffering at an early age. I think what we can all agree on is the importance of healthy eating and the desirability of avoiding highly processed, sugar-rich fast food. And alongside these changes in our thinking, there's been growing awarenesses of the stresses we are placing on our planet, on our land and our waterways, and the risks for food production that are created by climate change. We've always been a land of plenty, but the times are changing. Our planet cannot support our current lifestyle without significant change, especially as our global population growth continues unchecked towards nine billion people. And we now know from the recent UN report on biodiversity and ecosystems that of the eight million different species that share our planet, one million of them are currently facing extinction, many of them within decades. So we in New Zealand cannot be complacent and assume that in our little corner of the South Pacific, we're somehow immune to the changes that are coming. We've been world leading producers of protein to feed the world, so let's continue to aspire to a leadership role in food production. By transitioning to more sustainable ways of farming and producing healthy and sustainable sources of protein, we can mitigate risk and honour our responsibilities as kaitiaki, as guardians of our land. And by developing and championing new protein products, particularly those that can be raised or grown sustainably and which minimise the production of protein-rich waste, we can help feed the world. At the same time, we can help preserve a future for the flora and fauna that coexists with us and whose future is imperiled. Crops like hemp, which was mentioned earlier, which is easy to grow, which has a very small carbon footprint and a wide variety of applications and health benefits. I know it's quite tough to process, but that's the, where the innovators come in. And for those of us who still aren't convinced, it's perhaps added motivation to know that this month's US listing of shares in Beyond Meats, the company that makes burger patties from pea protein, was the best performing IPO in the US since the dot-com boom nearly 20 years ago. I think in the first year they added over $2 billion to their market value. Of course, achieving this level of success is going to require change for farmers and for consumers. And change is something that we humans struggle with. With very set ideas about what constitutes food and the introduction of new types of protein will challenge that. Take, for example, insect protein. 80% of the world's population eats insects. So farming hoo-hoo grubs could become as lucrative for New Zealand as its kiwi fruit and use far less water or other resources. Now, apparently, they taste rather like pine nuts. But for me, and I'm sure for many of the rest of us, overcoming the squeamishness of the idea is a little bit of a challenge. Others of us have fears about the safety of food produced in a lab. And then there are those of us who see any moves to change the food we eat or the way we produce it as, attack, as an attack on their personal rights. I have a story about when I first became Governor General there was quite a lot of interest in the fact that I followed a plant-based diet. And one of the daily newspapers even published an article about the menu that we offered at the dinner following my swearing in. And the headline in the paper was, No Animal Harmed for Governor General's First Dinner. Um, I thought the article was reasonably harmless, but it did not find favour with a gentleman from Nelson who wrote a letter to the editor complaining that to invite people to dinner and subject them to one's dietary eccentricities with no alternatives seems to be the height of bad manners. <laughs> Who knew vegetables could be so controversial? I am in fact proud of the fact that Government House is now serving more plant-based options in our menus and that we're in a wonderful position to showcase the wide range of food produced in New Zealand. 
we're innovating in our own way, and the traditional and the, co and the new coexist very peacefully on our menus. That the health of the planet and our continued existence depends heavily on what we choose to eat is quite a responsibility. But I think New Zealanders are ready to shoulder some of that and play a lead role in the future of food. So I look to you, innovators amongst us, the inventors and the food producers, to help us do that. Kia ora tato kato, katoa. Um, thank you very much indeed, Dame Patsy. And um, I was intrigued by the um, uh, letters of the editor writer from Nelson's comments. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce um, our second speaker, uh, who's Dr. Karen Zinn. Um, Karen is a, a registered dietitian and senior lecturer at AUT, uh, with more than 20 years experience in nutrition and health, and um, has and established herself globally as a leading dietitian and advocate of the whole food, low carbohydrate, health, fat, nutrition approach to optimal um, health and disease prevention. Uh, and um, she's co-authored uh, four books as uh, part of a, a series on that. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Karen here to talk about uh, these crucial nutritional aspects. Um, a very uh, warm welcome for Karen, please. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Good morning and kia ora to you all. So I'm here to talk about the nutrition side of things. And I want to start by saying that every action tends to have a reaction, and we very often see this in public health nutrition. We've seen it in the SunSmart campaign, where you have a, a good reason to avoid getting, uh, getting burnt and getting melanoma. So what we do is we end up lathering ourselves in sunscreen and covering up totally, and the impact or the reaction of that is we're starting to see insufficient vitamin D bioavailability from the sun. Another example is our great reduced salt campaign. And um, that is actually being debunked at the moment as well. But what has happened is um, in guiding the population public health-wise to decrease salt intake in their cooking, we, have, we are starting to see deficiency in iodine, which is added to salt. So two really good examples of good reasons to make change, perhaps not so much the, the salt reason for hypertension, good reasons for action, but the reaction might not necessarily be how we intended. And I worry about the action that might eventuate when we start moving away from animals or substantially reducing the consumption of animals. And while we want to save the planet, we need to be very careful that we're not going to be ruining the health of the individuals in the process. So let's have a look at a plant-only diet. There are some key nutrients at risk. And one of the nutrients that is often touted as being at risk is protein. And I haven't actually included that because I don't believe protein is hugely at risk. It's quite easy to get your protein, um, protein in as, as, as a vegan or plant-only eater. But let's have a look at these other nutrients. So from iron, iodine, calcium, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin B12, and several of the omega-3 fatty acids. And I have underlined two of these, vitamin B12 and DHA, which is docosahexanoic acid, one of the omega-3 fats, for important reasons. So I want to talk a little bit about vitamin B12. Vitamin B12, a crucial vitamin for central nervous system development and cognitive function. Vitamin B12 does not come in animals. Okay, so a plant diet is devoid of vitamin B12. So if anyone here in the audience is a plant-only eater or a vegan, you need to supplement. I hope you're all doing that. If you're not, you can go down to the pharmacy on your way home. It's really, really important. Vitamin B12 is made in the gut uh, by bacteria, but the problem is, is that we absorb all our nutrients in our small intestine. So by the time the bacteria get hold of our fiber and start producing vitamin B12, that's in the colon, and that comes out the other end. So unless we are consuming what comes out the other end, 
um, we're not getting B12 if you're not eating animals. So that is a very important point. And there have been some high profile cases around the world of deaths in infants um, from not being exposed to vitamin B12 because of vegan philosophies of parents placed on children. And we want to avoid that. Omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, is an incredibly important essential fatty acid for infant brain growth and development. Omega-3 fats comes from fatty fish, such as salmon and tuna and sardines, as an example. You might be thinking, well, in a plant-based diet, we would get omega-3s from linseeds and from walnuts, and you'd be correct. But the problem is, is that those that type of omega-3 is arachidonic acid, and arachidonic acid needs to be converted into DHA. That is the form that we need it. And in a plant-based diet, the conversion is very poor. So if we go fully plant-based, we've got vitamin B12 and DHA as, as issues, and they need to be supplemented. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Eat Lancet paper. So thank you, Rod, for introducing it. Uh, this was the first I'd heard of the planetary diet. And um, you might not be able to see this, but this is the diet that was put forward uh, to have the, the best outcome on, on sustainability in terms of climate change, in terms of resource utilization. And I'm not going through, I'm not going to go through all of it, but what I want to just highlight here is that the diet is much higher in grains and much lower in animal protein. Um, you can see, what can you see here? So uh, a couple of things I just want to highlight at the, at the bottom. So we've got all, sweet, all added sugars or sweetness at the bottom, 31 grams per day. That's about eight teaspoons. The World Health Organization suggests that we need to be under 10 teaspoons of added sugar for health and under five for optimal health. So here is a diet that we're proposing that might save the planet, but it's actually pushing up our sugar intake above levels that require for us to be um, living in an optimal um, status. We've also got um, an interesting mix when it comes to added fats. So from dairy fats, uh, we have zero, so we, we shouldn't be having any dairy fats. Um, and we should be having quite a bit of unsaturated fat oils. So we're talking about seed oils, so oils that come from um, predominantly seeds, so canola oil, sunflower oil, rice bran oil, soybean oil, heavily processed oils that are very high in omega-6 fats. And omega-6 fats in relation to omega-3, if we have an imbalance, if we have too much omega-6, what we see is systemic inflammation in the body. And inflammation is the root cause of all chronic disease. So I have a, I have a big problem nutritionally and health-wise with the Eat Lancer diet. And so does my colleague Zoe Harcomb, obesity researcher in, in the United Kingdom. And she did a quick analysis on the planetary diet. And as you can see, we've got about 14% of our total um, energy intake coming from protein, 35 from fat, 51% from carbohydrate. Uh, bear in mind that this is, for, this is based on 2,500 calories for an adult male. So we'll talk about the implications for someone who's not eating that many calories in a, in a minute. 14% protein, 14% um, of total daily energy from protein is minimal. It's less than our current guidelines, which, which put us between 15 and 25%. That's, where, that's how we guided to eat now for optimal health. Now, you might say that 90 grams for, uh, for a, a, a male might tick the box of the recommended daily intake for protein. But if you really get into what the recommended daily intake is, it's the amount to prevent deficiency. So do, you want to, do we want to be living in a prevention of deficiency state, or do we want to be living optimally? I would, I would guess the, the latter. The protein in this diet is incredibly low. It does not account for optimal growth and development. Anyone who's trying to optimize their protein levels to prevent issues later in life, or anyone wanting to grow muscle, very, very little chance on this diet. 
Carbohydrate, 51%. That's in the middle of our guidelines at the moment, 45 to 65%. I want to talk about carbohydrate in a little bit. Um, and fat, 35%. That's a good amount of fat. Um, but the quality is something that I really worry about. Looking at the micronutrients, you can see there are a range of micronutrients that don't stack up using the flawed um, RDIs, but still, they, they don't stack up. Um, there's a particularly um, worrying, oh, sorry, worrying imbalance of the omega-3 to omega-6 uh, ratio in there. Um, and of course, the vitamin K that we get from plant-based diets versus animal-based diets are in a form that is less able to be utilized optimally by the body. I want to um, spend the last five minutes or so talking about the science. Now, there is a divide in the science. There is a school of thought that believe that how we're guiding the population to eat at the moment and the science that guides us is good. There is another school of belief, and I happen to sit in that school of belief, that the science is flawed and the guidelines are flawed. And this is part of the problem that while we are following the guidelines, we are seeing a massive increase in obesity and particularly diabetes. So, and I hope that some of you have questions for me um, in the panel because I'm not going to have the time to go through all the science now. So I just want to touch on it. High sugar and carbohydrate science. Now we all agree that refined carbohydrates and sugar is a problem, but we don't all agree that carbohydrate is a problem. What people don't realize is that all carbohydrates turn to sugar in the body. That is biology, that is biochemistry. There was a, a body of knowledge that's coming out, a, a body of evidence that is showing that carbohydrate reduced, base, carbohydrate reduced diets have incredibly good efficacy for reducing weight, for imp improving blood sugar control, and for reversing, and I will use that term again, reversing type 2 diabetes. In fact, the American diet American Diabetes Association has just included low carbohydrate and very low carbohydrate diets in the in their spectrum of diets, which um, which are effective for reducing HbA1c, which is blood sugar control. So that is a that is a really important point that we need to consider. The diet heart hypothesis that is that if you eat saturated fat, which is uh, pinned on animal foods, we get from animal foods, we also get from plant foods, but uh, it's, we tend to get a lot of it from animal foods. Uh, when we eat saturated fat, it increases our LDL cholesterol and that causes heart disease. And to cut a very, very long story short, the, when you look at the totality of the evidence, it doesn't show that at all. And in fact, it's not the saturated fat that's the problem, it's the sugar that is the problem, and we are beginning to realize that now, and this is one of the reasons why the National Heart Foundation Pick the Tick program was, re was retired, because it didn't take into consideration sugar in guiding people how to eat. So saturated fat is potentially neutral or beneficial rather than harmful. It's certainly harmful when you eat the, the donut with the cream, but if you eat whole natural fat, from animals, no problem when it comes to health. Red meat and chronic disease. Well, you only need to look at the headlines that say red meat causes cancer, particularly bowel cancer, to get really, really scared about, about red meat and to move towards plant-based eating. And I'll have to say that the red meat studies are the most flawed out of any of the studies around. And what typically happens when you go into the critique of these studies, what you see is that when they look at the, the groups that have high red meat consumption versus low red meat consumption, the people or the groups that have a high red meat consumption are also the people that tend to be smokers, they tend to do very little physical activity, they tend to have a high body mass index, and they are surrounded by poor eating habits and health behaviors in general. Plus what they do is they collectively join all the meat in that high red meat eating category. So they are including um, a, a nice piece of eye fillet steak uh, that you get from a grass-fed animal with a hot dog. 
So they are combining all that meat together, and they are they're very, very different things. So I think the evidence around red meat and chronic disease is is not true at all. And lastly, the plant versus animal debate when it comes to evidence. If if anyone says to you that there is plenty of evidence to show that a vegan is way healthier than an omnivore, it's not true. That study has not been done. There have been a range of studies, and they're all observational, um, which is quite different to intervention-based studies. So they take populations and they look at um, plant eaters versus the standard American diet. We know the standard American diet is, is a tragic diet. So when you look at those two, of course the vegans are going to come out looking great. One of the biggest issues with the plant versus animal studies is something called the healthy user bias. So people who are eating plants in general are very aware of planetary health. They also tend to look after themselves. They tend to um, have positive health behaviors. So when you look at the studies, um, you're always going to get a whole lot of positive health behaviors that go alongside um, eating plants versus eating animals. So it's, it's an unfair study comparison. They have done some good studies looking at uh, two groups, or well, population-based studies anyway, looking at two groups, those that eat animals and those that eat plants, in the context of whole food, good quality food, and they find no difference in terms of longevity and health. The study that hasn't been done is the intervention study, where they do exactly that. They take two groups, and they, um, they, both of the groups are eating whole unprocessed food. One group eats meat, one group eats plants, and comparing outcomes long term. They haven't done that. That study has not been done. So the science is somewhat flawed at the moment in these areas. So I'd like to just finish by um, asking what the difference is between, if you can th think of the difference between the, the combo on the left versus the combo on the right. And you probably all know it. The combo on the right doesn't contain meat. So what I want to say is if we think that by going more plant-based, the world is going to clean up its act and suddenly get more physically active, eat whole unprocessed foods and look after themselves, that's awesome. But the reality is, is that you and I might prioritize health, but the masses don't. So what we're going to see is people are still going to be eating poor quality junk food. The difference is, is that there's going to be less meat in it. And that could be a problem for not only chronic disease, but also for nutrient deficiencies long term. So my last slide, I'd like to issue a global warning. And that global warning is that we need to be very careful that with this action, we don't get a reaction that might save the planet, but in the process, make the populations unhealthy. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed, Karen, for um, uh, giving us a, a very uh, clear and um, challenging message on the nutrition issues in this, um, and, um, and with that uh, um, warning at the end there. Um, now, uh, as you know uh, from Tony's introductory remarks, we very much hope to have uh, Susie Amos Cameron here in person, um, but uh, Family Matters took her off to the States um, at short notice. But she has, as soon as she arrived, uh, filmed um, her presentation. So here it is. Hi, Christchurch. Kia ora. So you're there, and I'm in Los Angeles. And I'm really, really honored that I was asked to come and speak at this conference. It's, you know, sustainable protein, healthy people and planet. It's a subject that, well, it goes deep inside my heart. And I'm really sad that I can't be there in person. And I'm sure that there are plenty of parents in the audience. And you know that when your children call for you, you run at high speed towards them to help them. So that's why I had to blast back to the United States um, 
for my children. Anyway, I'm really, really excited to be here and I, to at least participate electronically, digitally, whatever you want to say. Um, I have a lot of statistics, but what I'd really like to do is sort of take you on a journey of how I got to this place where I am now is about, you know, going out in the world and talking about plant-based proteins and how they affect our health and how they affect our environment. So just so you know, I know we have a lot of farmers in the audience and I actually grew up in Oklahoma and we have a farm there. This is my horse Toby from when I grew up and yes I grew up with eggs and bacon and we actually grew cows and pigs on our farm and we ate them. Um, so I understand, we understand a lot about what farming is and you know how challenging it can be. Um, so I just want to I just want to put that out in front first. I realize too that even though I do have permanent residency in New Zealand, which I love and it feels more like home than the U.S. does at this point, but I know that I'm still considered an outsider. So I don't want to come across as, as coming in and, and telling everybody what they should do. I'm just going to take you on a little journey. Um, of all of the things that I've discovered over the past seven years. So yes, I grew up there and in May, May 6th actually, 2012, I watched a movie called Forks Over Knives. And I was coming at it from completely a health point of view. Jim and I, Jim's my husband, Jim and I both have heart disease, cancer, diabetes, arthritis in both of our families. And there was a point when doctors were starting to tell Jim that he needed to take heart medications. Prophylactically, there wasn't even anything wrong. And I just kept saying, no, 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 you can't do that because of the side effects and, you know, that it's, it really wasn't necessary. Anyway, I watched this movie and I had it on in the gym and I had to basically get off the treadmill after 10 minutes and sit down. I was... I felt betrayed, ultimately. I felt betrayed that we had been told our whole lives that we need meat for strong bodies and we need milk for strong bones. And this movie, Forks Over Knives, basically says it's completely the opposite of that. So I ran up to the house with a DVD and I told Jim that I needed an hour and a half of his time the next day. He said, oh cool, well where are we going to go? And I said, we're not going to go anywhere. I want to show you a movie. And he said, oh, great. Well, I love movies. What are we going to watch? And I said, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I just want to watch the movie. And then we're going to have a conversation around it. So we did that on May 7th, 2012. And we actually watched it here on this screen. And by the time we got into the kitchen, he said we shouldn't have any more animal products. And 24 hours later, we cleaned out our kitchen and that's what we did. Now I understand that a lot of people don't roll that way and it's kind of something once Jim and I get something in our heads we kind of go full force on that. Um, but it was really a, a moment, it was a very very pivotal moment in our lives and I had actually been working in the environmental sector for decades. I had learned all about environmental issues, uh, dead zones, ocean acidification, bi deforestation, biodiversity loss, all of those things. And no one had ever mentioned anything about animal agriculture. About maybe two months after we went plant-based, Jim started educating me on the environmental devastation that was taking place because of animal agriculture. And I had been in environmental circles for decades and no one had ever mentioned anything like that before. So it was like this double whammy that ended up happening. I found out, you know, first that we'd been advertised to our whole lives, that we needed meat and dairy to be healthy. And now I'm finding out that it's also a huge contributor it's the second leading cause of greenhouse gases and climate change 
more than all transportation combined, every car, every airplane, everything. So we were walking on the beach one day, and if you know my husband and you know his movies, so there's Terminator, Aliens, The Abyss, Avatar, Titanic, he's kind of a doomsday kind of guy. So he's, his films are all about death and destruction, and he does not use the word hope. He has a t-shirt that says hope is not a strategy, and he wears it regularly. This day that we were walking on the beach, he turned to me and he said, you know, babe, for the first time in my life, I have hope. Well, needless to say, I almost fell into the surf. But he said to me, the more we can move, the more we can inspire people to eat plant-based, the more we can move the needle on climate change. And it was absolutely in that moment that I knew that that was my calling. I knew that I wanted to write a book, I wanted to create content to inspire people and educate people about you know, the detrimental effects of animal agriculture, not only on our health, but on our bodies. And that we want to be able to have you know, healthy, healthy families, healthy planet, healthy bodies. And um, that's, that's when I went down that road. Now, 13 years ago, I founded a school with my sister, Rebecca Amos, called Muse. Now, Muse is an environmental school. We start at two years old and we go all the way through 18. And we thought we were feeding the children the healthiest food possible. We had grass-fed beef and free-range chicken and all of our dairy was completely organic. And the children were actually growing a lot of their own produce as well. But when, after we went plant-based, my sister and I looked at each other and said, we can't call ourselves an environmental school and still be serving animal products. So in fall of 2015, we became the first plant-based school in North America. Maybe the world, because nobody else has come out and raised their hand to say that they're plant-based. But we did it for environmental reasons. The children know why the school is plant-based. They, they know they grow probably 80 to 90 percent of the produce that they eat every single day uh, out of our 150 raised beds. And it wasn't an easy task though, I have to say. When we went plant-based, it was mutiny. It was full-on mutiny. We lost about 50 percent of our families. Now, we quickly regained our enrollment and we have now surpassed it. We have people from all around the United States moving to go to the school because it is plant-based. And we've had a couple of families even from Europe come over. Um, but one day, shortly after we went plant-based, uh, we were getting a lot of pushback from our parents. And our head of school, Jeff King, got very frustrated one day. And he said, people, you can feed them whatever you want to in the morning and whatever you want to in the evening. It's one meal a day. It's OMD. So that's where OMD was born. And I knew exactly in that moment that that was going to be the title of my book. And that was an invitation into the plant-based world. And as I've gone around the world on book tours, that's what I get. It's reasonable, it's easy, it's graspable. It's something that I can do every single day, whether it's putting almond milk on my cereal instead of cow's milk, or having a bean and veggie burrito instead of a beef burrito, or having tomato sauce on my pasta instead of a beef sauce, or you can get those yummy beef crumbles now that are plant-based and put those in there. So it's, it's a simple, elegant way of helping the environment and helping your health. So when I was working at the environmental NGO, I learned about polluted water, biodiversity loss, deforestation, climate change, and dying oceans. And there was a moment in one of those meetings when I was able to connect the dots back to animal agriculture. And it was then that I realized that if we change to a plant-based diet, all of a sudden we can protect biodiversity 
protect you know, reforestation instead of deforestation. We can slow climate change, clean oceans, and have fresh, safe water just by changing what's on your plate. The other benefit of eating plant-based is you have 57% less Alzheimer's, 25% less diabetes, 43% less cancer, and, and so on. And yes, it does, it is beneficial for your sex life, but that's for another talk. Um, the one thing that in doing research, the statistics for New Zealand is we are number five in heart disease, we're number five in diabetes, we're number two in osteoporosis, and we're number one in bowel cancer. One out of every seven New Zealanders are diagnosed with bowel cancer, and three of those die. And the main cause for those diseases is consumption of animal products. So here's the cool part. That's all the like part that isn't so much fun to hear. But the very cool part is the consumer interest in veganism is trending upward more and more and more. New Zealand, you see right down here, this cute little island, is they are number four in interest in plant-based eating. One out of every seven New Zealanders identify as vegetarian. That's a, an enormous amount. So I think that there's a, you know, the potential of actually making a difference, not only in the environment, but in the health of the population as well. In America, we have a 40% drop in milk consumption since 2000. And fortunately or unfortunately, people around the globe like to follow what Americans are doing. So there is a trend around the world of people starting to consume less dairy and consume less meat. Um, I know that, um, that in New Zealand that people, you know, there are plenty of dairy farmers that are struggling because of the, the drop in consumption of dairy. Now, here's the fun part. <clears throat> So when Jim and I did go plant-based, our whole lives, we absolutely did a 180 on multiple different levels, you know, not only from health and things like that. <laughs> not only from health and things like that, um, but we started looking at every investment and every business venture through a plant-based lens. So we started looking at those trends, the trends you know, that I just showed you from the map and from milk consumption going down. The plant-based food sales growth is through the roof. And I do have some statistics that I'm gonna share with you. It's the plant-based products are the fastest growing sector in food production. Alternative milks, just this past year, was at 1.7 billion. Beyond Meat surged 163% in their trading debut. That's Beyond Meats, the Beyond Burger, which are yummy, and I know that they're in New Zealand now. Dannon, which everybody knows Dannon, they have invested $12.5 billion in dairy alternatives. The alternative milk and cheese and dairy has been up 8% in the past year. The dairy icon Dean has invested 70% in good karma foods. And so $16 billion invested in the last 10 years, 13 billion just in 2017 and 2018. So you can see the trends going up. There are so many, so many um, opportunities to be able to make a transition and shift to another way of thinking about farming by looking at the plant-based sector. There is a farm 
here in the United States called Elmhurst. It's a dairy farm, 90-year-old dairy farm. They started to see the trends. They completely shut down their dairy, and now they're making their own plant-based products. They've got almond milk, hazelnut, oats, brown rice, and peanut. And I know that they're actually right now doing uh, yogurts and ice creams as well. So there's a, a huge market for this all around the world. I used to go into Common Sense, and I don't know if there's a Common Sense down on the South Island, but uh, the one in Wellington. And just three years ago, in the refrigerator area, there was sort of a smattering of different products, uh, different plant-based products kind of mixed in with all of the, the dairy and the meats and that sort of thing. Now, there's a whole chiller that is full of plant-based alternatives. So you can just, you can walk into Common Sense and see it in your own backyard. So Jim and I, um, as we were starting to really look at this, we realized that what we really wanted to do was not only help the land, but create jobs, help the, far help the farmers, help the environment, help the water, help the air, and make a profit as well. Because if you can't make a profit, then why is anyone else going to, going to go into this sector and try to do anything? So what we have done, as, and it was very experimental, I have to say, um, but it's now proven, we have farms up in Saskatchewan. We started investing in farms, and we started working with the local farmers. And then we decided to build a plant-based protein factory. So we have our, a vertically integrated business. We have our own seeds. We work with the farms. Verdient Foods is where the, all of the pulses, so we have lentils, fava beans, chickpeas, and uh, yellow peas. And those are all run through Verdient Foods to create protein, starches, and fibers. And then we've been working with the University of Saskatchewan to create food products. Um, so those are being packaged and distributed, and they'll be launched probably within the next month. So one of the things that we realized is, yes, you can grow these things, and you can ship them out as commodities. But the better thing to do, and the more profitable thing to do, is to create value add. So you are creating massive amounts of jobs, and it's that triple bottom line thing. You're doing something socially that's good, environmentally that's good, and you're making a profit as well. I want to talk too about, because um, I know that it's a big subject for this conference, is what does our plate look like? in the future. How are we going to feed 10 billion people by 2050? I'll be a pretty old lady by then. Um, but I think this gives you an idea. So one acre can produce 60,000 pounds of produce. You can take the same acre and get 37 0.6 pounds of beef per acre. So you do the math on that. It's like how many steaks and how many burgers is that? It's not a lot. It's, I don't, it's not even a quarter of a cow. <laughs> so when you're thinking about feeding all of these people and taking care of the environment and taking care of your health, vegetables is the silver bullet. Eating plant-based it doesn't matter if you're doing it for the animals, or for your health, or for the environment, or for your waistline, or, yes, for your sex life. It doesn't matter. Everybody wins. It's a win, 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 win all the way around. So change, change is coming. Change is inevitable. And if we don't change, we're going to end up like Kodak. Now, one of the things that I've always been impressed by from the moment that I stepped foot 
in New Zealand so many years ago in 2008 when Jim was shooting Avatar was just how resilient New Zealanders are and how resourceful they are and how quickly they can pivot to do something else. And I think the other thing too that is just an amazing character trait is how much people in New Zealand absolutely love their land, they want to protect it, they care about it. You don't see that all over the place in the United States, but you see it everywhere in New Zealand. New Zealanders are proud of their homeland, and I could absolutely see people looking to find ways to help the environment. The IPCC report that came out of the United Nations they give us 11 years to turn things around. And I know that in New Zealand we can't, we can't hit our Paris Accord numbers unless we look at animal agriculture. So you might ask, what can you do to help the environment and help your health? You know, very often this question comes up and we get paralyzed because we don't know what to do. There's so, so much confusing noise out there. Yes, we can recycle. Yes, we can change our light bulbs. If we can afford it, we can drive an electric car or a hybrid. We might be able to put in solar. But there's something, a simple, elegant solution to being able to make a difference just as an individual. So one person eating one plant changing swapping one plant-based meal a day for one year saves 740,000 liters of water and the carbon equivalent of driving 5,000 kilometers which is if you're if you start at the bottom tip of the South Island and go all the way to the top tip of the North Island you do that three times that's what you're cha that's what you're saving from changing one of your meals a day for a whole year. Now I know that we have 200 people in the audience, so you can do the math. If everybody today chooses to change one of their meals a day to a plant-based meal, collectively we can save 148 million liters of water and driving tip to tip, again, 600 times. So I implore you, I implore you to try OMD and to change one of your meals a day. Because if we don't do something for the environment, it won't matter if we have environmental schools. It won't matter if we have dress design contests, eco clothes. It won't matter if we have electric cars. None of that will matter if we don't have a planet to live on. Thank you. That's uh, the second time in uh, recent weeks I've heard uh, Susie speak, because she spoke um, with James at uh, the Just Transition Summit a few weeks ago in New Plymouth. And um, there was much more there about her own journey in this. And um, so um, I thought there was, um, and, and about the vertical integration that they're achieving um, in their business, um, which um, is, uh, I think, very useful for today's discussion. Now, given that um, we've had great challenges thrown down on climate and food um, or on nutrition, um, or for the, and the Governor General uh, too on how New Zealand might approach, it now falls to our last speaker, Maury Leyland, um, to, um, as um, a person who's very involved in uh, the agricultural sector, um, to give her perspective. And it seems to me that this is such a great challenge, it's a good thing that uh, Maury is definitely a Renaissance woman. Um, I will start uh, at the beginning of her career because as an engineer, uh, she was involved on the design team for the 1995 um, winning America's Cup campaign. And um, so that deserves a big hand in itself. 
but then on um, in business, most notably um, in the years that um, she worked in very senior jobs at Fonterra from 2005 to 16, and then uh, plenty of um, non-executive roles in other companies such as um, Genesis and in energy, and then in not-for-profits such as the Education Hub. Um, but these days, with her husband, John Penno, uh, one of the founders of Sinlay, of course, uh, here in Canterbury, um, she's very actively involved um, in areas of plant protein and nutrition. And then from an overall farming perspective, um, she has a really important role on the steering committee of Toho the Tohono movement. And uh, this is a wonderful thing that grew out of um, um, very um, influential agribusiness leaders here teaming up with Stanford University um, for a program to um, help our people involved in agribusiness here to um, be immersed in that um, um, kind of California innovation system uh, to understand how that might work for us in New Zealand. And um, so, as I say, um, a Renaissance woman who's going to try and... Sorry, we'll have a good discussion afterwards. It's not entirely up to you uh, to bring these threads together. A very warm welcome for Maury, please. Thank you very much indeed. Nakoto. Um, welcome to Tai Tapu, this very pretty corner of Canterbury. And I'm able to welcome you because if you could see through this wall and behind us, you would see, um, you would see the top of our farm uh, where we have a um, rather marginal sheep and beef farm. Um, there's a rather pretty view from Gibraltar Rock and through to the valley on the other side is where, where our farm is. And um, at the top of it, there is this uh, volcanic knob, and we're at the moment working on restoring about 30 hectares back to native bush and putting a deer fence um, around, this, uh, around this knob. It, of course, once sat in a totara forest, um, and since it hasn't been totara forest anymore, there are still two totara remaining clinging on, but the big tree you can see is a wilding pine, and obviously you can see the gorse. Below that are the, the feature of Banks Peninsula underrunners, big enough for animals to fall in and die. And um, if you go into the areas where the kanuka is regenerating um, and there's no grazing, you can see that the understory is completely destroyed and the, and the ground turned over by feral deer. Now, as we go down the hill, um, our neighbour who we uh, wandered across to see in the weekend likes to joke that he has all our topsoil because the, 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 the delicate lurse uh, of the Port Hills and, the, and Banks Peninsula um, has, has run off. A lot of it is indeed in his lovely garden, but of course it's not all in his um, garden because a lot of it is drained through to the Hallsville River. Um, the Hallsville River is, is quite pretty with, uh, with the English trees, but of course it's not really a river. It's actually a drain which is draining the wetlands of Tiwaihora, so a lot of our topsoil is of course in Tiwaihora. And uh, Taitapu means sacred shore, so once I imagine, I don't imagine lapping white sand beaches, but I do imagine the wetland certainly extended that far. Uh, but today, the Hallsville River, um, while pretty, is in the worst 25% of lowland rivers in New Zealand. Um, it's just, it's got its own story. It's not all rural, it's not all dairy farms, there are other things going on. But every river in Selwyn has its own story and a similar result. And every river in Canterbury has its own story, and New Zealand. And then you go offshore to the world, and you see that story repeating for different reasons and for different measures. But there is a, a disappointing similarity between those stories. So what we're doing with our farming in this beautiful country, and Taitapu is beautiful, it's just, it's not working. We need to do something that is a little bit different. So back to the question of the day. What does sustainable protein mean for our industries, our um, beef, lamb, dairy industries bring in well over $20 billion every year to this country. Are we about to lose them? Do we say goodbye and turn around? I, th I think that's a real challenge that we need to work through because obviously we can't do that. We don't want to do that. But our country is suffering. Diets are changing. I think it is now time for things to start to change. <clears throat> I'd like to dispel one myth, though. And that is that there is a lack of demand. While there are changing diets in the Western world, and many of us will be changing our diets, the demand for meat as third world countries increase their populations and become wealthier is increasing. We're going to see demand for meat and likewise demand for dairy continue to grow. So the challenge for us is this demand exists. We could continue to participate in it in the way we have, but for the marginal dairy, the marginal meat that we produce, 
that will be going into the commodity game, the high volume commodity game, which we've played for a long time now. We know that game well. And it, it's delivered us a lot, but we can now see those gains are going um, if they're if not gone. So what is the opportunity <laughs> now? Um, th this is the challenge th as I see it. This is the impact difference between an impossible burger and a beef burger. Now, there are many reasons to pick this apart. I certainly agree with, with Karen. I don't particularly like burgers. I don't think they're particularly good for your diet. The point that I want to make here is just the difference in scale of the impact between the system which produces that burger and the system which produces a beef burger. The farming system here, of course, the study is a reputable study, but it would have been done on different farming systems to New Zealand. But you look at those percentages, 90, ne eutrophication, less than 92%, global warming potential, 89%, land occupation, 96%, water consumption, 87 You've got a fair degree of magnitude to move before you're getting to numbers which are small or similar. So the challenge, as I see it, is this. How do we work to reduce our impact while producing high-value products that the world wants? We're so proud of our beautiful country. It's a huge tourism pull. Um, we all have our hearts connected to it, but we're not at the moment delivering in a way which is producing what we want to be producing and delivering to what the world wants in a way that's going to maintain our reputation and the high value that we've traditionally been able to achieve. And as we've worked through, uh, Rod mentioned my invo involvement in Te Hono. Our challenge there is how do we shift our farming systems from a push of our commodity products through to sh shifting that around to a pull um, among consumers? And how do we understand those consumer needs better? And how do we work to meet them? And so while the demand for meat and dairy globally is not going down, it's going to go up, but in different countries and different products, we do know that the demand for plant-based products, plant-based proteins, and better food options uh, is increasing. So we now have the situation where our impact must reduce, and there is demand, particularly in first world countries, for different ways of eating. And consumers, when they look at good food, they're not just looking, does it taste good anymore? I think for the first time, probably in human history, people will say this is good food because they feel the whole story about where it came from is good, not just because it tastes good. And for the first time, people are actually even prepared to compromise taste to achieve that. So that's where those two things have come together. The impact has always been less, but people haven't been prepared to, to compromise. Now those two things start to come together. So what do we do? Um, this is a question that uh, John and I have spent a, a lot of time thinking about. I left Fonterra three years ago. He left Sunlay last year. And we're com committed to New Zealand's primary sector and how we find ways to take it forward. And it isn't the easiest question. So we've got to ask ourselves and find the answers to how do we farm? What should we be farming? What ecosystems do we ne need around us to support that? And what level of ambition should we have in relation to that? And this is an area that we have thought about and in invested in a number of these topics. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of each of these challenges and the things that I've observed. So how should we farm? Uh, there are uh, companies now, like Sunlay, um, other dairy companies are following, meat companies are following, where they pay extra money for farms which meet with Lead with Pride programs or other farms which have much better environmental, environmental sustainability, animal welfare outcomes. So this is a shift that we're going to see further, and every business who was um, who is using our products should look to promote this higher value from better quality farming, and every farmer should aspire to be part of one of these programs. That's part of it. We also know a lot about how to farm to achieve these, so even if we haven't yet got the programs and uh, some companies haven't quite managed to make the point where they can turn that into value, they'll figure it out, so we need to use the science that's out there and get ahead of the game. I guess one of the challenges I have is that these are two little investments that we have. The one on the left is Regen, and the one on the right is Pastoral Robotics. And there are many other examples um, that I know Blinkers Coordinator talks about um, that are available in our industry today. <clears throat> so Regen on the left, they help um, you manage how you spray irrigation, effluent in your nitrogen usage in a way which minimizes impact 
has a much better outcomes in terms of productivity and resource use. And Pastoral Robotics has a robot called Spikey, which as you tow it around your paddock, it identifies urine patches and squirts a chemical, chemical similar to DCD, which increase the grass's ability to uptake that nitrogen and increase the growth and reduce the runoff. I think what's in common with all of these companies, whether these two or others, is that farmers aren't buying. They're sitting and waiting, and they're waiting for regulation, and regulation is sure to come. But if we're actually passionate about doing something like this, we've got to get more active and more involved and utilising the technologies which do exist today. We can't complain the technology's not there. It's not perfect. It won't develop rapidly if we don't invest in it. But we all have to get behind this. We can't wait for the magic bullets um, to come and to arrive. Secondly, what should we farm? When I left Fonterra, um, I was lucky enough to work in a world which was full of incredibly capable people. Um, very talented, any resource or person or research that you needed was at the tip of your fingertips. But you come outside the dairy industry and then you start to look outside beef and lamb, apples, kiwi fruit, wine, and the capability and the resources to support those industries just uh, is down, down a very steep curve. The resources just aren't there to exist. So do we have a magic crop um, waiting in the back to burst out and be as big as these other crops? Well, the truth is at the moment that we don't. But do we have potential to find them? We do, but we have to start putting in some resource into, into going investigating, taking some risks, integrating them in our current farming systems. Uh, hops is one example. Um, we have a hops farm up in Nelson where at the moment nearly all hops are grown. I think in New Zealand we all just sort of know that hops only grow in Nelson. It's absolutely fundamentally not true. This is a high value crop. Um, our hops in New Zealand have beautiful flavours. They're in demand by craft brewers around the world and yet we've sort of managed to compress our little industry to sit in one part of the country. We have opportunities to take these things further to Canterbury and beyond and to look into others. We've seen the quinoa operation in the Wairarapa, uh, saffron, and we see avocados doing well. I don't know if all these things are the right solutions, but there is certainly a long list of things that we could be investigating and um, researching further and integrating into what we do. And then going head on into plant protein. The plant protein examples that we've seen, I think the Beyond Burger is made of pea protein and the Impossible Burger is made of it's, it's based text, uh, textured vegetable protein and soy protein. I think for these two large products, um, we, have to have a, we have to have a look at them and say, for soy on the right, soy is a massive crop around the world, largely used as animal feed, causing enormous deforestation, has its own issues. But we just can't grow soybeans in New Zealand, so it's not like at the moment there's a better soybean that we can grow here and, and trump the world. So I think we can leave that off our list of things to do. Peas. Peas is more interesting. We've had a long history and tradition of growing green peas. We grow them well and yields are good. But the world has zapped off in the direction of yellow peas and we don't have the research, the experience, the farms to follow. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we can follow and maybe there are some things which are about to come out of the, around the corner. But if we want to go there, we'd better go hard and fast. So the topic of ambition. What ambition should we have? Well, there is one um, thing that is behind New Zealand's success in dairy and in beef and lamb, and that is that New Zealand grows green leafy crops exceptionally well. We've got high rainfall, a temperate climate. Um, I, I think we all know the reason that we have great milk and that we're able to compete on the commodity cycle is because we grow excellent and cheap grass. So we have a, a young company um, called Leaf Foods, which Ross Milne, our general manager, is, is here in the audience. And our ambition is to work with the green leafy crops, which are a vast and abundant source of protein, but at the moment, unless you have several stomachs, you're not particularly going to be able to access it. Um, to integrate that into our farming systems and to turn that into ingredients that can support changing diets around the world, whatever those products be, whether they be milks or meats or ingredients in other and existing foods, because we do believe that we can find some solutions which are unique to New Zealand's strengths, can play into our farming systems, and can deliver what customers want. It's an ambition at the moment. It's not a, it's not a guaranteed goal. But we do believe that that kind of ambition is appropriate at this, at this time. Now, all of this um, doesn't exist without the ecosystem around it. 
And one other reason that um, some of those crops haven't been explored or why farmers are sitting not knowing what to do is because New Zealand is short of the bit in the middle. We don't have enough food companies making products and calling out for new crops. We have phenomenal, phenomenally innovative, fast-changing, ready-to-go farmers in New Zealand. But unless there is a customer or a consumer on the other side, and a company in the middle which is producing products to serve those needs and creating the demand, there's very little that a farmer can do. So we need more million, five million, 10 million, 100 million dollar food companies which are serving the needs of consumers. The example on the left um, is a company we've invested in called Pure Foods. Pure Foods makes uh, food for people who, whether because of their age or state of wellness, can no longer chew food and require pureed food. The traditional solutions for this have been horrific tasting muck that uh, lowers people's desire to, to get going in life. And Pure Foods produces food which um, has fantastic outcomes in terms of people's ability to recover from their illness, get out of bed, get some joy back in their life from what they eat, because when life is that bad already, having to eat horrible food makes it even worse. Now, they're, a new, they're just starting to export now to Australia and got ambitions beyond that. But these are the kind of companies that we need pulling on our New Zealand produce, creating that demand for farms to produce new, to new products. And we need more Sinlays, you know, I don't mean in dairy, but we need companies which connect those ingredients, encouraging farmers to do good work, creating value on top of the farming to make sure it's sustainable, to bring those to the tens of millions of consumer companies around the world. New Zealand and consumer goods is always going to be a difficult proposition. We need to be connecting to the big companies, the Danones of the world. And then the surrounding ecosystem, I think we all know the importance of many of the groups which are here in terms of the universities, the research institutes, um, the councils and the role that they have to play in, in uh, making this change. But we also want our reputation as a country to be based on the quality of our food, the food safety of our food, and the, the traceability and authenticity of our food. We uh, alarmingly are in a unique position to do well at this because of some of the scares that we've been through that I know rather, rather too well. But we generally produce high value food, whether it be infant formula or honey um, or our fine cuts of meat or the many products still to come. So if we can lead the world in some of this technology around how to build um, that unique link back to source, back to the farm, uh, know the safety of the products that come out of our fine country, um, Trust Codes being one which now has a QR code on every um, any um, infant formula that you buy out of the, the Sinlay um, factory, the A2 infant formula will have a QR code on it. If you scan that QR code, you will know every time that QR code was scanned throughout its life. And it links back to a picture of that can with the scoop and the milk in the factory, that exact can. So it's these kinds of systems and the technologies that we need to build to support that whole ecosystem. So we do have a big challenge ahead of us. It is multifaceted. Karen and Susie talked about quite different things, but I think we've got, world, we've got room here for all of those views. We need to change. Our environment cannot cope with what we're doing at the moment. Consumer demand is changing, and it's changing towards good food, and we can produce that. And we need to encourage, um, innovate, uh, get in behind the companies, the people who are prepared to take those risks and get on and do those things. Thank you. So I'm just going to um, very briefly um, traverse a couple of things with our panelists. And the first one is um, about the nutrition issue. So I'll go to Karen first on this. Um, there is clearly, um, talk about unsettled science <laughs> in nutrition, um, ridiculously impossible question to ask, but uh, to answer. But how might we best progress um, as a country um, on those very big um, nutritional debates. Um, we do have a national science challenge, for example, on high value nutrition. Um, is that the sort of place that we should be building out um, our knowledge and making sure there's a really good uh, and well-informed debate on these nutrition things? Right, okay. Um, I think the way to move forward with the unsettled science is actually focus on what we all agree on 
And I think the two things that everyone agrees on is that refined carbohydrate and sugar is a, is a big problem, and, this, and the science is showing that. And the other thing, which is just coming through in the research is, now, is the problem with processed foods. And I, I, do, I do worry about alternative protein sources that are packaged and have other things added to them. That is essentially processed foods. So while every single food nutrition guideline in the world is incorporating a, a meat threshold and a, and a sustainability guideline, they are also including a guideline on eating whole unprocessed foods. So. I'm not sure if I answered your question at all, but I do think that the saturated fat argument will play out, and we need to just let that play out because we've got, you know, hence they say science advances one funeral at a time. That's that's how you know that's how it goes, um, and and the salt uh, the salt one's playing out at the moment. So I think let's let's focus on on sugar and whole unprocessed foods, and move forward with that, and work on the others. In the process. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. That um, gives us some, some very useful avenues to pursue, so thank you. Now I'm going to ask a more an equally difficult question. Um, um, farmers understandably um, have, um, they want to innovate, um, but there is a heavy capital and commitment to what they already know in terms of farming. Um, so what might be some of the help, some of the changes that we can make um, to help um, farmers on this transition, um, especially as we, we don't know where we're going. We know where we need to get to, but we don't know how to get there. So um, is there a worry that the levy or bodies um, um, or the likes of Federated Farmers are uh, really struggle to, to move beyond um, um, business as they know it? Mm. I think that we need to appreciate that we're at the end of an era, and that era has generated an enormous amount of wealth, and I think if you're a beneficiary of that, it is a really hard position to change from and to invest in when you can't see equivalent wealth or equivalent returns coming from the investment that you now need to make. So I think we have to acknowledge that it's very difficult to get your head around. Um, I think the change will be required sooner rather than later, but I guess we need to make the change wanted. So, we, you know, as I said, we do have good technologies, good knowledge about how to reduce runoff, protect our waterways, uh, manage our farms better, use uh, soak crops, um, maybe diversify what's going on on individual farms. These are decisions that we can make, and the only thing that's stopping us, I think, is that wealth protection question of, but this won't be as wealth generating as what I've had advantage of for the last 20, 30 years. Yes, I think my response to that question is that um, we've gone through this extraordinary period in the world where food has become incredibly cheap for many people. Um, and I'm wondering if we're turning a corner here, and it's not that necessarily food will become more expensive, but in a sense it'll be more highly valued um, by people for the benefits it brings them. Uh, and therefore in that transition or, or that shift back the other way, um, uh, there is a sense that there's going to be real um, business opportunities and wealth for farmers in that. If we have the companies which produce those high value goods, which have the ability to tell that story to consumers, every marginal dairy farm that we now convert to, to produce whole milk powder, the consumer is not interested or getting that story. Hmm. So that's why we need to focus on high value goods that consumers want they want to know where they've come from, and they are prepared to pay the extra dollar. That's not every consumer, but I think it is the consumers that New Zealand wants. Yes, thank you. Dame Patsy, a question of, for you, if I may. Um, I'm very intrigued um, in your career that you were right in the thick of business of Bradley Investments at a time of, uh, another time of great transition for the New Zealand economy. Um, and um, on reflection, uh, are there some lessons from that previous great transition um, that you think will help us um, in this current transition, not, not just for farmers, because as I was saying in my presentation, this is across everything we do. 
Um, uh, how's, how's that for another like impossible question to answer? That's an impossible <laughs> question too, thanks Rod. But, um, well, we do know that we are adaptable. We are versatile. I think someone said that earlier today, maybe Susie. That, that we, we can change. And what I think people are finding challenging um, is the idea that suddenly we'll stop doing what we've been doing and have to do something completely different. Mm. And I think what we realise, or what we should realise, is we just need to be open, as we have been in the past, to new ideas, new, way of, new ways of doing things, and change uh, incrementally. So looking at, as, as Susie Cameron was saying, one meal a day plant-based to try some other things to eat. Farmers trying new crops, trying to diversify what they have on their land, how they use their land, um, looking at different ways of protecting their land and so forth. It's not everything at once. And so I think the thing that New Zealanders can be is very adaptable. We've done that before. We can do it again. And we, we need to be, um, and part of being a small economy and quite <laughs> tightly integrated is we can be fast movers. We can change things much faster than a lot of the rest of the world. So let's turn that to our advantage. Let's actually embrace change. Let's see what works. You know, I'm thinking of how many avocado trees can I plant and grow down? <laughs> I mean, there are, there are small things, but you mentioned, Maury, a number of crops that could be quite a potential for New Zealand. Of course, the leafy one is the, is the obvious one, but hemp, I think, must have great potential. It grows like... Weed, it is a weed, <laughs> and hops. So, you know, why? Let, let's embrace opportunities for trying things out. They won't all work. But if we stay the way we are, we know we can't survive. The planet can't survive. Absolutely. I, I do take great courage and hope, though, from the fact that an ideal a diet, uh, seeing as they grow like weeds, is hops and hemp. I, I think that sounds fantastic. <laughs> and I'm sure I can make that healthy somehow. As long as I... Well, the whole yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, now, we've got to take at least three questions because Susie offered um, a copy of her book signed to the first three people to ask questions. So who... who these two ladies are still holding microphones. This is terrible. Uh, there's two people there and one person there. Um, I'll take the lady there first because she's the nearest. Thank you very much indeed. Your question, please, and congratulations on getting one of Susie's books. Thank you. Hi. Um, random question that might not be answered, sorry, today, but do you think that permaculture and the New Zealand dairy industry could be integrated in some way? Do you think there could be legislation for that kind of thing in New Zealand? Whoever wants to take that, Maury's ready to go, I think. I, I'm, I do not pro proclaim to be an expert in permaculture. I suspect there is a role in New Zealand for more permaculture than we currently have, and possibly including on dairy farms. Um, we've got to look at new ways of planting and use ways which are more sustainable for the soil, the nutrients and the water. Um, personally, I don't see legislation because I think we've just got so many things that we need to focus on first, but I do see the potential as it being a method to help us address some problems in some areas. Thank you. Um, a lady back there, thank you. Um, now, this is a question actually for Maury as well. Uh, we talk a lot about the, the capital uh, investment of our food producers, our farmers, uh, and that change away from monoculture and, and encouragement of a diversification of land use. But also there comes a challenge of the harvesting of multiple different crops within one particular part of land use. What examples can we see in different business models of the landowner um, to be able to... Uh, source more capital to be able to have as multiple different multiculture as opposed to monoculture. Yeah, so about the, the system that we use, because obviously a dairy shed is a, is a big integrated investment that sits in the, in the middle of the farm. I think that is a, good, um, is a good challenge for us to solve, and I do see that we probably have the opportunity for more intermediary businesses which help support farmers with a more shared asset base, more mobile units, uh, doing different things, um, perhaps leaving, um, providing some services to the farmer, but, but also working at a service to uh, the companies which are processing, processing those foods. So I do think if we want to change to become more diversified, then having more technology around mobile infrastructure um, and contracting type 
companies who can go and perform that at an excellent level, I think could help us get there. Thank you. Um, a question back, the gentleman back there. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, I was just wondering if you've got any advice around how to um, get central government to work together, um, get the different ministries to talk to each other, um, especially around hemp and the legislation. Um, there's still a lot of barriers for farmers wanting to grow hemp. They're not allowed to have their paddock five kilometres from a school. You're not allowed to see it from a road. You have to get a policeman to come and check you out. Um, that's just huge barriers where it should be just a normal crop. It should be just as easy to start growing like wheat or barley or something like that. Have you got any advice for that? Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're talking to a specific issue, which is a symptom of a larger issue, and I'm sure the universities here would also like to talk passionately about it. And that is, as a country, we don't identify what our priorities are. So in our primary sector, um, we are all working in a frenzied manner, often in ways which aren't aligned or slightly different directions, or maybe are aligned, but we're not pooling our resources to work together the best. Um, so we haven't identified, for example, that hemp is anywhere in any of our national priorities, and therefore there's been no effort to um, pull resources together to align to enable that industry. And many other industries would point to the same issues. So I think that particular one is a difference between a country like ours and a country like the Netherlands, where they set priorities at a national level, and that flows down through their policies, their legislation, um, the research that gets the funding. Um, and to the benefit of, of people then like you who are trying to work in a priority area would then get the benefit of that aligned support. So I know the universities uh, also struggle and the research institutes struggle with this and I hope that as a country we can continue to find better ways. Thank you. Um, any other takers on that question? No, thank you. Um, another question. Um, a, gen a lady in there. Thank you very much indeed. Can I tee up another microphone? Because we're going to have one... This question and one more. One last question. Thank you. Hello, this is a question for Maury again, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you showed us a slide of a comparison between um, a pea hamburger and a meat hamburger. Uh, and later on you gave us a slide showing how uh, Lead with Pride is a, a system which could be uh, usefully adapted in all sorts of other farming areas. If it was adapted in the area of meat, that kind of system, do you have any idea, any indication of how good we could make a hamburger using all the very best technology, the very best things that we know now, what that comparison with a, a pea hamburger would be like? Great question. Um, I think the answer to that would come from a number of areas because I think, uh, I'm sure I've read newspaper articles about burgers which you pay $120 for because they're the finest burger made from um, the cow which has a name and has a story which goes all the way back to the, the moment it was conceived. Um, so I think that in that instance you'd be wanting to target one of those burgers where the quality of the meat that you're producing um, has every aspect that the discerning burger eater <laughs> um, is looking for. And then I think you've got to go and say, how might we have a beef farm which meets the environmental animal welfare standards that we want to meet? And what would that farm need to achieve to do that in terms of its, of its carbon impact, in terms of the <coughs> nutrient runoff, uh, in terms of all the aspects that go around that, and then put those things together. And I think to reach that $120 burger <laughs> point, that might be um, a standard which um, we might struggle to economically justify right now. But why not target that? All these programs change with time. They all can have higher aspirations and keep leapfrogging up that. Um, so I think that's the kind of aspiration that we should have. Can I just make a comment about this? And it's really following on from something Karen said. You know, I'm fascinated by how the um, debates always get come to burgers. Now, I guess <laughs> seeing how Beyond Burger managed to um, increase its market value by listing, burgers are big. But burgers, by their nature, have got a whole range of other things in them, particularly all the carbohydrate in the, in the white bread and so forth that is heavily processed and, and so forth. It possibly isn't the healthiest thing to, to concentrate on anyway. And there are all sorts of really other enjoyable and healthy foods that are probably 
easier for us to produce, I would have thought. But, you know, I know people love burgers, but it, I don't think we should reduce it to whether we have burgers made with meat or burgers made with, with uh, plant protein. There's other, other food that we should be looking at. Can yes, I can. just add, and say, if we were, or when we get really advanced, what we, what we could do is we could farm crickets, because cricket protein is beautiful nutritionally. It has a very similar nutrition profile as an egg. So, and I believe a very small uh, footprint, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I believe that, that, it, that that's the way to go. So what, there's already cricket flour. So what we could do, if you insist on going with a burger idea, we could make the buns out of cricket flour, and we could use hemp oil, which is high in omega-3, which is great, to cook the burger uh, patties yeah. in and put the greens, because vegetables are, are, are great. No one's doubting that. So we could actually, we, we could actually come right for the burger long term. Solved the problems. There you go. <laughs> I, have had, I have had cricket bread, and there is a little bit of a taste profile that needs to be worked on. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite, quite artisanal, then. <laughs> That's right. Um, and just to chip in my point of view on this from a, a business journalist's point of view, uh, the um, Beyond Meats float was quite extraordinary, um, but defies all reality because the company is too reliant on one supplier of peas, um, and it has doesn't have control over its manufacturing processes. Is largely subcontracted, so the current valuations are complete nonsense. I would suggest. So However, some so, that's yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Um, we're going to have to stop. Um, uh, I know that's. Uh, oh, sorry, I did promise one last question. Thank you. Well, thank you, and um, it'd be great to be able to sum this up. But this has been really fantastic, but also frustrating for those of us at the grassroots who are donkey deep in, in the in the real stuff. Um, and, and look, I think that last little conversation summed it up. There's a bit of a distraction when you start talking about crickets or burgers. This is a much more complex, and my question is, do you agree with the complexity? And I just want to run a couple of wee points past you. Um, the the um, Pinot Farm, that destruction was not production um, destruction and that uh, runoff, that, because it's in the press today, that's, that's um, noxious animal. Now, is that property, does that need to produce food? I don't think so. The subject that's missing today is fibre. And my philosophy is it's about the right land use, the right water use for the production of food and fibre, sustainable food and fibre, healthy food and fibre for the human race. And if we had that as a starting point and end point, I think these other conversations would take care of themselves. So I can see that property um, producing fantastic natural fibre and not having meat um, or, or other food uh, coming off that property, for example. So um, I, I, I need a question, don't I? Um. Yes. <laughs> Just a, a slight intonation rise at the end would be fine. <laughs> so, um, so my question is, you know, do you agree that this is complex? Because even the carbon footprint of uh, uh, your um, your ideas, huge carbon footprint. I saw a big tractor there. I saw machinery there. <laughs> You know, so the whole of life carbon footprint of some of these alternatives that are, that are around uh, are massive. So this is complex in terms of the carbon issue, about the environmental issues and the health issues. And we just need to work our way through calmly, uh, through the right solutions, and not look for silver bullets, whether they be crickets, whether they be burgers. Do you agree this is complex and we need to work through it as a complex issue? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And your question of land use is, I mean, your point of land use is, is, is an excellent one. Um, I, but if you go right up to the big question, then the, this damage is caused by humans. And I don't think we're quite at the point yet of saying, OK, we need fewer humans. So while, we've, while we're here, we've got to do the best that we can do. Um, so I think we've got to work, push hard through that complexity. But I do acknowledge it. Yeah, I 100% I agree as well. And I think one of the fundamental flaws of the Eat Lancet report is that there's this belief that the planetary diet is the healthiest one for you from a nutrient and health perspective. And if it wasn't for the unsettled science, then it, there would be less complexity in, in that area. But um, because of the flaws, because of the complexity within the health system and the, the health model, and health area, that, that just adds another layer of complexity beyond the whole sustainability uh, carbon footprint. So I 100% agree. Mm. Absolutely to the complexity. And so I'll make this uh, by way of a concluding comment, if I may. Um, 
uh, we've had this um, extraordinary wealth of um, information and insights today, and they are extraordinarily complex. Uh, this is only the beginning of um, a great transition. So our ability um, as a country to uh, think very clearly, be guided by some very uh, core values um, that we hold, and to do the right thing by the biosphere, by this land and water and air, and by the people, um, and for the people, gosh, this is sounding quite American, um, um, is, um, it is you know, the, the wonderful opportunity for us. Um, so I, I hope that um, today um, encourages you um, uh, further on that uh, wonderful investigation, that journey. And so um, a big thank you to Blink for organizing this. So thank you to Tony and your colleagues, um, but um, um, to Karen, to um, Maury, and to Dame Patsy, and Susie in her absence, a very big thank you to all. And thank you all for coming. Thanks. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you to the panel for a very stimulating and thought-provoking morning. And I think the last question about complexity is exactly what we have ahead of us. And it needs all of us to work together and recognise the deficiencies and where we've got lack of knowledge and how do we gain that and that there are no silver bullets. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for your contributions. And please join us for a cup of tea and keep the conversation going. Thank you.